Uh, web sockets. Uh, so we're going to talk about adding real-time data to your app uh, with Swift Neo and Network Framework. Uh, all pretty new and exciting things. Um, so hopefully you learned something. Uh, first of all, I want to thank 360 for having me, and also the people individually I've talked to over the last couple days, uh, asking them kind of if they knew about web sockets or what they would like to hear. And so thank you for all that feedback. I've tried to adjust the talk a little bit to handle what the feedback I got, but uh, we'll see. It's just, web sockets itself is not a big subject, but the other stuff is, so hopefully we'll get through most of this, and hopefully you'll learn something if you know a little bit about it. Uh, I'm John Bauer, uh, everyone. Um, I'm an engineer, iOS engineer at Pandora. I work on the iOS app there, so if you ever use Pandora on your iPhone, um, that's what we try to make great every day. All right, so today I hope you'll learn a little bit about each one of these things. Uh, we're gonna talk about HTTP protocols and their associated hacks. Uh, we're gonna talk about the actual WebSocket protocol itself, um, in case you've never worked with it. We're gonna touch on some concepts behind Swift Neo, and then we're gonna look at a WebSocket implementation on both Swift Server and on a Swift client in a demo app. So you may be asking the, the big question, which is, you know, why WebSockets? What is this thing? Or why do I need to do it? And uh, I think if we use the immortal words of a great man about the world, um, Genghis Khan, I believe he said, uh, pull to refresh sucks. <laughs> said it very angrily one time in battle, but I think he's right. Uh, what we really want is, for certain applications, we want data as fresh as possible, right? And in a news app or something like that, it sucks when you're always like kind of waiting for the next thing and you have to do that. So um, let's look at kind of what we can do to get there. I think it's important to understand about when you look at WebSockets, it's important to know a little bit about the history of uh, HTTP protocols and their associated hacks and how we mimicked um, real-time data uh, earlier on in the web world. Um, even pre-iPhone, um, but it all kind of ties together, so bear with me for a minute. Uh, probably as a refresher, but just in case you haven't thought about it deeply, uh, let's talk about HTTP in general. So that's the Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Um, it's stateless, okay? That's important, meaning that every HTTP connection you make is uh, kind of solo, it's on its own, it's independent. It transfers some data, it makes a connection, and then it drops off, okay? Uh, this happens over a TCP socket, so there is an actual socket happening, even at the HTTP layer. That's how you connect a client and a server. Um, and there's a big reliance HTTP on MIME headers, and these are things that you probably maybe take for granted, but things like content type and a bunch of information that's probably uh, communicated in each request, which the user doesn't necessarily pay attention to, but as developers we certainly are aware of. Uh, and if you want to make a secure HTTP connection, you do that over HTTPS, not HTTP. Now, for every HTTP connection, there's actually a lot that goes on behind the scenes. Um, a lot of back and forth talking. Uh, this is how you make a TCP handshake, right? So there's um, a sender, so you're, you're, in our case, a mobile phone, but a client. Talks to the server, says, hey, I'm here. Server says, oh, hey, how you doing? Uh, what do you want to say to me? And then the client says, okay, I want to send you some data, maybe securely, and says, okay, well, let's make sure we can handle that. Let's go back, let's have a handshake there, and then finally, you can actually send the data you want to send, which might just be, you know, what do you want to say? And they might just say, hello world. But there's a lot of back and forth to get to that point. Uh, and this can add up in time, resources and uh, it can be somewhat expensive. Now we take this for granted because most of our traffic happens this way, but there's actually a fair amount going on here, which also leaves room for optimizations. Uh, if you haven't looked at the headers, um, this would be like a regular get request um, to page using HTTP 1.1. Uh, we're going to go to breakingnews.com and get the latest, right? And as a response, that server is going to reply 
Uh, content type, you see there, I have to have bolded just to say that's a MIME header, right? So it's transmitting data back and forth. All this stuff has meaning um, to a web server or to a client or to a networking library. Um, but this is how this is communication. And the actual content is there down at the bottom, which might just be, hey, this is some breaking news, right? Also important here is the connection close header, right? So um, we've finished the communication in one call and response. So fast forward a little bit, still in the past. Um, on our mission towards some sort of real-time data, uh, HTTP2 came along in 2015. And the idea behind HTTP2 is that you had only one connection per origin. Um, and this allows for this idea of pushing from the server. It actually has the idea of server push built into HTTP2. Um, and it's a it's a, an attempt at being more efficient with these connections, right? Um, just as an aside, if you really, really focus on getting HTTP2 connections, um, using effective caching strategies, things like that, you can get all these headers down to like eight bytes. So um, there's a lot you can do with HTTP2 to make things faster, more efficient. Um, if you want to compare the two, so there's HTTP1 here, which we just kind of described. Um, let me get index HTML. Okay, here's the index HTML. Oh, I need a style sheet reference in HTML. Okay, go get style sheet. Oh, okay, here's style sheet. Oh, let me go get a JavaScript, vice versa. That's HTTP 1. HTTP 2 kind of allows you a little bit, um, there's efficiency here. You say, give me HTML, and the server knows that there's these other associated resources with index.html. And so it can push them kind of in a bucket to you. Uh, and you can uh, set priorities on different content types. So maybe you want the index.html uh, page to come first and the JavaScripts to come last, something like that. So um, we're getting more efficient here. And this idea of push is built into this. So how do you use HTTP2? Okay. Um, What's interesting about this concept is that you actually always start with an HTTP 1.1 connection, okay? So you never really know if the server is going to support what the client's asking for. So the client plays dumb and always sends HTTP 1 connection first, a request. So this is called an upgrade negotiation request. And the client will say, hey, breaking news, uh, how you doing? I would love to talk HTTP 2 with you can you talk about, you know, can you speak my language? And this header here, this connection upgrade, is a very specific header which signals to the server that the client is interested in talking a different language or a different protocol. In this case, the client is specifically saying, the upgrade I would like is H2C, which indicates to the server that it's HTTP2, um, and maybe any associated settings that the client is interested in using. The server is going to respond in a couple different ways, right? Uh, the, in the top there, if the server does not speak HTTP2, um, it's going to send a 200, which is a response code that means everything we communicated successfully. Uh, but it's HTTP 1.1, and it's going to send the 1.1 response. Meaning, you know what? I don't speak HTTP2, but let's just keep talking HTTP 1, and the client should fall back, and that should be fine. Or it's going to send a very specific response code. And most of the response codes we're used to are things like 200s, uh, you know, 401, 403 for authentication, uh, 404s if a resource is not found, or 500s if everything really went bad. But one of the lesser known ones here is a one, 101. So if the server can then speak the language the client is requesting, it's going to send a 101 back to the client and 101 stands for switching protocols. And it's going to repeat the upgrade. Uh, yes, we're going to upgrade, and we're going to go to H2C. That's how the handshake works and the upgrade negotiation works. And from then on, the client knows that it can uh, expect or talk and expect HTTP2 communication. Now let's talk about some HTTP hacks that came along uh, along the way. So polling is one of them. Uh, long polling and SSC. We're going to breeze this really quickly. In polling, 
you may have done this in your mobile app several times, but in order to kind of mimic real-time data, you uh, just have a timer in your app, and you just keep calling the breaking news you know, API every 10 seconds. And so you know that, okay, if a user's using their app, every 10 seconds I'm gonna refresh their news, okay? Um, it's one way to do it, okay? It's not the most efficient way, but uh, you're burning a lot of radio and all this stuff, but hey, that's one way to do it. Another one is long polling. This kind of came from the web, uh, which was another hack, which is, hey, go make this long blocking request uh, and wait for data from the server, so you block the, the thread, and then when there's some data, Server sends it back, and as soon as you get this, you make another one. Uh, this kind of came out in the Ajax era when you wanted one fragment of a web page to have like some sports scores or something. Uh, it's really a bad solution, but it was kind of genius. In the, but it's still a hack. SSC, which is server side events. Um, this is when you can client can make a request, and then the server can push back over time. So an example of this might be. Uh, I'm going to kick off a Jenkins job or something, or a database migration, and I want to get pinged back with progress. And so the website or server can push back small amounts of text, which might be your progress, and you can update some meter on that. Uh, it's good for small text updates, um, but you can only do UTF-8. So it means you can only have text data, and you cannot do binary data. And in our iOS Swift world, that means you cannot do JSON data, right, with a capital D. Um, you'd have to have text. It comes back as like a content type event stream or something like that. So it's, it's not what we're used to working with. Um, it's good for some web stuff, but it's still a hack in terms of what we're looking at. So if you're using any of these, this might be a good chance to learn about WebSockets, and maybe you could replace that with a WebSocket. Okay, let's get into the actual WebSocket protocol itself. So this became a standard in 2011. WebSockets allows a bi-directional, message-oriented flow on top of HTTP and TCP. Technically, HTTP is not required, but 99% of the time you're going to use it, it's going to be over HTTP. Uh, in bold here is that you can use ETF-8 or binary messages, right? Which, again, works for JSON data with a capital D. Uh, once you're connected, you can use app-specific, they call it some protocols, that's up to you, whatever app you're making. And there's this idea of protocol extensions, which we won't get into, but uh, you can have additional extensions on with a web socket protocol to allow uh, compression, multiplexing, and other stuff like that. One note before we move on. Uh, the web socket protocol we're talking about is more about the handshake. If you were to do some Google searches about learning about WebSockets, chances are you're going to end up reading about the HTML5 WebSocket API, um, which is different than the actual protocol itself. Uh, I wanted to make this talk family friendly, so we're not going to have any JavaScript at all. Uh, so WebSockets, at its base level, it's RFC 6455. Um, this is one of those kind of crazy white papers which no one wants to read, but um, maybe it takes a couple hours if you're really interested. It's not that bad. Uh, it describes the protocol framing design, uh, what the special headers are, security model. It's really not as scary as it looks, I promise, but I won't link to it because it'll probably scare you. Um, but a couple hours and you can get through it, and it's pretty interesting. Uh, but we won't have to go that deep. Um, so once, take a step back. Let's rewind and talk about that upgrade negotiation thing. So what is that, what's happening there? It's an agreement between the client and the server. That means uh, it's going to, whatever is gonna happen in the new protocol is gonna leverage HTTP and your existing HTTP ports. And you're gonna reuse that HTTP connection. And so WebSockets works exactly the same way as what we saw in HTTP2. The differences are just the headers. So WebSockets have its, its own specific headers and it has an upgrade negotiation request as well. Um, these headers are WebSocket versions. So it says, hey, server, uh, I'm going to speak this WebSocket version. Uh, the WebSocket key, which is actually an auto-generated challenge. It's like a hash. Let's think of it like a puzzle. Um, and if the server can answer the puzzle, then the two know that they speak the same protocol. Uh, 
There's the WebSocket accept, which is what the server would send back to uh, kind of prove that it knows how to solve the puzzle. Uh, the protocols, which is any list of sub-protocols, and these are specific to your app. So if you're making a game called 360 iDev, and you want to have your own uh, message, you know, protocol, you can say, oh, I speak the, I, you know, the 360 iDev protocol, and the server has to reply with one so that you agree that you're, you speak it. And any of these extensions I mentioned, which are, these are optional. So looking at the actual request, again, we start in HTTP 1, call to breaking news, connection upgrade, except this time we're going to ask for a WebSocket. Authorization is there, so authorization works just like HTTP, uh, but only for the initial connection. Or HTTP, yes. Um, and there's that key thing I talked about, that weird hash. That's actually going to, you won't have to implement that yourself. That's usually handled by the um, existing implementation, like in your browser, or in our case, in our networking libraries. But just know that that's how it works. Here's the response from the server, 101, switching protocols. We're upgrading to a WebSocket. Uh, and there's the WebSocket accept header, which is the answer to the puzzle. And then can agree. Cool. And as soon as they do that, there's this handshake at the top. And once that happens, you've got this open socket, which you can do bi-directional messages, and it's persistent. Um, either side can close the connection at any time, so you have to be aware of that. Um, and that's, that's all there is to it. Uh, if you want to do, so there was HTTPS for secure. In this case, WS is the scheme, and WSS is what you do um, when you're going over TLS to be secure. So you should always do that. All right, let's take a break from the idea of WebSockets for a quick second, switch gears, talk about Swift Neo. Uh, and you'll see why this matters in, in a little bit. I believe it was Napoleon who said, I hope to live long enough to see real-time data in iOS apps. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't think he lived long enough to see this, but uh, you guys actually are alive at a wonderful time, and we can start to see this really taking shape. So just the description on the GitHub page for Swift Neo is an event-driven network application framework for high-performance protocol servers and clients, comma, non-blocking. So there's definitely some keywords in there that we've been talking about. Sounds like this could have some uh, benefit for us. Um, and then we'll, we'll unpack the rest of what's in there. Swift Neo is a low-level networking framework, non-blocking I.O. Um, it's actually just a Swift port of Netty, which is, for a bad description, it's basically Swift Neo but for JVM. Um, it's used in a lot of places for a lot of real-time uh, stuff but with Java backends. So this is Swift's port of that. It's open source. Currently there's 79 contributors from Apple, IBM, lots of people from the Swift community. Um, so Swift Neo 1 supports versions 4 through 5 on Swift. And if you're going like 5.1 or 5 above, you're going to be using Swift Neo 2, which came out this year. Um, that won't matter for what we're looking at, but just know that if you're diving into the latest and greatest, you're probably going to look at 2. So non-blocking I.O., what is I.O.? I.O. is anything like a database query, external network request. So if I call out to Google and say, give me the latest news, and Google says, one minute, I've got to go to another API to get that, that could be something you know, on the server that it has to go and get. File streaming, and hey, WebSockets. It's all I.O. This is the worst graphic I could ever make for this, but I'm going to try to. Uh, talk you through this. And uh, there's better ones online, but I was trying to not use copyrighted material. Um, so in a blocking example, OK, let's compare blocking and non-blocking. In a blocking example, client makes a request to a server. A server needs more data from somewhere else, right? So in this case, a database. So it can't respond directly because it doesn't have all the data it needs. And so it makes a blocking call. And I put sync there, so if you're familiar with GCD and like the difference between making a synchronous call versus an asynchronous call, um, that might make it clear. So it makes a synchronous call to the database. Meanwhile, the X is showing that the server, this thread is tied up. It's blocked. That means the client, or any other client, cannot make 
another request to this particular thread. Now as a server admin, your main concern is having the most available threads for all the clients who want to connect to you. So you worry about resources, and when this thread is blocked, the longer this call takes, the more resources you're tying up. Now you want this to resolve, and you want the client to be happy, but now your focus is how much hardware and load balancers do we need to have all this you know, availability. Anyway, it comes back to the server, and then it responds, then it unblocks, and the client keeps going. This is a blocking call. This is actually pretty standard, so what we're kind of used to. Again, bad graphic, but now let's look at a non-blocking example. I'll try to explain this. Client makes a request via its own async, like our traditional, like GCD. The difference here is that the server, instead of making a blocking call out to its other peripherals, like a database, it's going to make a call which will immediately return a future. And we'll get into this in the, we'll get in this in the future. But a future is basically um, data that's going to be resolved at some point forward. So it's going to say, all right, I don't have this database information for you right now, but I'm not going to tie up the thread waiting for it. I know that at some point, sometime I'm going to get the uh, database, and I'm going to return this right now. Eventually, sometime, the future resolves itself, and it, the response comes back. The difference here is that while the database work is going, the server is actually still available. That thread becomes open again. So this allows for higher availability of these threads and more efficiency on the server of managing the resources, memory, all this stuff. Bad graphic, but hopefully this will become more clear as we go through. I put the word async there too because you can think of it like the server making an async, like a GCD call as opposed to a synchronous call. Okay, so why would you use Neo? If, you know, if this is new, we haven't used it up till now. So if you're using custom protocols, it's a good, good thing. Uh, if you're using, uh, sorry, for efficiency and scale, um, this is really cool. If you're using constrained hardware or network like IoT devices, this might be beneficial. Um, and then the big thing here is that Apple no longer supports use of BSD sockets. Um, being a Unix platform, we're very used to kind of dropping down into like CF socket or any of the CFs if we want to do this stuff. Apple finally said, you know what, we're not going to do that anymore. Uh, we're building our own stuff. So please don't use CF network or sockets or any of that stuff. So, but the caveat here is you usually don't have to use Neo directly, okay? So this is more for your information, but you probably won't have to like drop down here. Okay, let's take another break. Now let's think about server-side Swift. Uh, the two popular frameworks here are Vapor and Kitora. Um, you may not have worked with them. We're going to touch a little bit on them, but uh, they're both excellent. Uh, today we're going to talk about Vapor for a couple reasons. Vapor is actually built on top of Swift Neo. Now Kitora uses Neo as well, um, but Vapor basically is built on top. It almost extends Swift Neo, everything about it. So everything you do in Vapor, which as a, maybe a web developer, you're just trying to build a website, you're not really thinking about it, but actually under the hood, everything is using Neo. Um, and because of that, everything in Vapor is a promise or a future, which we'll also get into. It's open source, and the cool thing about Vapor is that you can use every one of its packages independently, um, which means you don't have to use like an entire Vapor stack to do WebSockets or to do HTTP or to do one of its things. You can just use the uh, package itself and maybe one or two dependencies um, and go off and do your own thing, which is cool. Uh, Nostradamus, I believe, said, I promise you the future is coming. <laughs> and he was definitely using the capitals there. So he knew exactly what was coming. Promises and futures. Uh, this is kind of a tough one to explain in our time, but I uh, just know the keywords now. And I believe there's even a talk later today that uh, is going to get into this. So a future is a reference to an object that may not be available yet. Okay, and a promise is simply a contract to succeed or fail a request for a future. Okay? Um, these become structures that you'll work with in Vapor and in Neo. Um, and they're kind of 
built into the idea of asynchronous programming. Um, we don't quite have like a, you know, a, a async await yet, but these things will set us up for that in the future. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, um, but if this is confusing, and it probably is, um, these are some great uh, links that can kind of uh, maybe explain it a little more. Uh, so Vapor has a WebSocket package, um, and the WebSocket patch itself uses its own HTTP package, which in turn uses Swift Neo. But there's no other dependencies besides that. Okay. Let's. How can I get out of here? Okay. Let's jump into some code. So I'm not going to get too deep into Vapor itself. Um, this is not a tutorial on Vapor, and I kind of want this to be agnostic when it comes to frameworks. Uh, and I'm going to breeze on the server side stuff. Uh, but just to show you that we can do this all in Swift, uh, <clears throat> both sides. <clears throat> so in Vapor here, I'm just going to highlight the important stuff, because there's a lot of stuff that's kind of vapory here. But we're going to make a stock quote app, which is going to deliver real-time stock quotes to our iPhone app. Okay? So we're going to have this model, stock, very simple, company, ticker, price. right? Uh, it's codable JSON object. Never mind the extensions there. That's, uh, that's vapor stuff. But just look at the model here. And then let's look at this WebSocket class, which actually is just um, some of this stuff, let's say, let's just focus on this. So I'm going to write this socket function, which is going to basically pull a Neo WebSocket server. Neo WebSocket server is Vapor's wrapper around uh, a Neo WebSocket. Uh, going to the documentation here also is a little vapory, um, but I just want to kind of show you how tied in Neo is. They even call it a Neo WebSocket server. Uh, and I'll come back to this. But all we're really doing is handling the get is just a route. So we're going to allow this API to be in slash stock quotes. Uh, and then there's these, this function here uh, on binary. There's also an on text. So WebSockets can take one of two type things. They can take a text or a binary. And so in this case, it's binary. If we get a binary thing in, we're going to handle everything in this closure. Uh, the important stuff is really just this. So for now, quick and dirty, we're just going to make a loop. And I have this function called handle stock request, which uh, I'm basically going to generate fake stock quotes. They're going to go up and down like 5% randomly. Uh, and I have, I have this sleep here, which is always an exciting to do, uh, thing to do in uh, non-blocking uh, asynchronous development, throw a sleep in there and really create problems. But uh, that's to simulate what could be a third party request, okay? Um, probably wouldn't take a second, but let's just throw it in there. And all I'm doing is returning this struct. That's it, I'm going to get a fake price and returning it. That's all I'm doing. Okay, that's all I'm gonna show you for now on this part. Uh, actually, let's see. Let me see if I can run this. So another reason why I'm using Vapor as opposed to kind of just using the package by itself is because what Vapor will give me kind of out of the box is this web server. So I just ran this. The server is now running, and now I have a local host. I actually have a web server running at port 8080. Um, and I'm doing this all local, so I don't have to rely on the network. So I'm going to have a server and a client. Okay, so. Now we're running, and basically it's looping through this, and it's just sending stocks out. Um, let's stop that. Get back to this. OK, now let's talk about the client side. If you're using exist, if you want to add uh, WebSockets to iOS 12 or below, you can use these uh, libraries. Many people do. have been using them for years. They work. It's called Starscream and Swift WebSocket. You can use these. Um, that basically re-implements the WebSocket 
uh, behavior and implementation uh, in a library, so you can use these. Um, but what I want to talk about today is Network Framework, which was introduced in iOS 12. Um, it's part of iOS. And there's a lot of big additions in iOS 13. So in iOS 13, they introduced the ability to have low level, um, give the low level power to support custom framing protocols. What that means is that you can basically write any sort of known protocol. You can now build it in native like iOS. Uh, and it's, you know, in Swift, you don't have to drop down to C and all this stuff, so that's really amazing. And in fact, uh, if you watch the DubDub -Dub video, uh, Apple says that they use this new ability to actually write the native support for WebSockets in iOS 13. So this is something you could do for, like, WebRTC or something. This kind of gives me hope that we'll have native WebRTC support in a, in a year or two. Um, so there is a class inside Network Framework called NW Protocol WebSocket. This is what you can use to do this stuff. We're not going to mess with that. Uh, because, hey, it's also rolled into URL session, which makes it very accessible to uh, developers like us. So now there is a new URL session WebSocket task uh, built into URL session. This gives you native support for WS and WSS. And it's really now very easy to, um, to consume a WebSocket. And by the way, 99% of the time, you're never going to have to worry about creating the WebSocket on the server. Probably your IT department or your third-party API is going to say, here's a WebSocket, and you're going to do the client-side stuff. So the Neo stuff is more just for information now, but uh, in terms of how it applies to you, it probably won't be too bad. So let's, uh, let's look at the client-side now. Okay, now there is nothing special about this app, uh, and I don't even have to hide much. All I did up here was stuff, I have a folder called Stuff We Don't Care About, which is literally just like the uh, scene delegate and app delegate. There's no code in there that we care about at all, just hiding it so we can focus on the important stuff. So there's a model, which is the same stock model that we had on the server, same stock codable. And then we have two other files. We have a view controller, See, there's no tricks up my sleeve here. Uh, hope, hopefully this is big enough you can read. So we, um, let's go ahead and build this so you can see. Uh, you can, just so I can prove that, uh, let's see. Prove that I did not go to design school. Um, this is our app and uh, so we're going we're gonna to have this uh, app, which we're going to basically have uh, the, the stock, the ticker, and the price. Okay. So let's just so you see that you can now you'll see where these outlets come from, right? The labels. Uh, I've got a number formatter there. Uh, quick and dirty. I just have these default stocks, Apple and Amazon, um, and I'm just starting at these prices because they're different enough we can compare between um, Apple and Amazon. Uh, so here's a WebSocket client, which I wrote. We're going to go into that in a second. And then we've got, you know, these functions. And then I've got a, a display delegate here, which um, when the data comes back, I'm just literally just updating the, uh, the UI. Okay. Um, but let's go through here. So if you did load, um, I've got my new WebSocket client. I'm going to set the delegate to myself. I'm going to set the uh, default stock to be Apple. And then I'm going to call this connect function, which we'll get into. Let's see, viewed it appear, just has the, I'm just using the formatter there. And then this segmented control, which we'll get into in a minute, just so you see there's no tricks. Basically, when you change the segmented control, it's going to switch the stocks. Okay, so let's go into the WebSocket client, which again is custom, but very small. Um, let's start by... Yeah. Oh, that's okay. Let's... okay, just so you see that there's really not much to it. Uh, I've got some state variables up here. Um, here's, I'm going to create a WebSocket task. So this is what's been added to iOS, this URL session WebSocket task. If you dive into that, this is actually the URL session documentation, right? 
Um, this is not even network framework stuff, but under the hood, from Apple's hood is network framework. So this is a part of URL session task now, and it's super simple. There's a send, where you can send a WebSocket message. There's a receive. Send ping is like what WebSockets do to kind of like test the connection, basically. So it's a typical way you would do it. It's called a ping pong. You'll see that a lot, but we won't touch that. Cancel the connection uh, and close. And maybe a reason, right? That's it. Uh, and an actual WebSocket task, you have this uh, enum of a message. And again, remember I said there's only two types. You can get a data or a string in a message and send and receive. So send and receive both take a WebSocket uh, task message, which is just this enum here. And uh, the receive has a result type, right? So that's, you know, kind of a success or failure. It's like a promise type thing. That's, that's all there is to it uh, from an API perspective. So here's the connect. It looks very similar to creating a regular URL session task. Uh, I'm going to create this WebSocket task with the URL. In my case, it's localhost 8080 stock quotes. I'm going to assign that, keep a, keep a reference to the task. And just like with URL session, you're going to resume it to start it. And then as soon as that happens, I'm going to call choose stock, which, uh, cool. I'm going to take this stock. I'm going to send it, task send. That's the, the API. Send it as data. OK, if there's an error, cool. And as soon as I send it, I'm going to call receive. And receive is a wrapper for a task receive, which will get this back in this result type and check for a success or a failure. If it's success, I'm going to process the message. I'm expecting a socket task message. String we're not going to deal with here, but data. It's a data. And I'm going to decode it and then update my display. Disconnect is just a disconnect we called. We'll cancel it. That's it. So let's. Uh, Let's go back to the server and run it. Okay, so now we're, we're supposed to be spitting out the WebSocket is live. Now let's try to connect to it. Let me restart the client here. And see if our, all right. And so now what we have is this server streaming us these random stock quotes. And uh, we now have a live feed in our, in our app here. So what's happening here is that uh, we've made this initial request, the WebSocket, and then we have one open connection. This is not individual requests happening. So it's very efficient. And for each time, we're getting a, a stock struct getting sent back to us, and it's populating in real time. OK, this is coming from the server. You can see that the actual uh, double prices down there so I'm just rounding them up here, just display money. Um, but you can see the actual prices are coming through. And it's coming through on a one second interval because I have that sleep, the one second, right? So if I didn't have that, they would come in as soon as they were ready. But this is a nice even keel. So um, with the few minutes I have left, I'm going to show you one more thing here. So if I go to Amazon, hmm, nothing's happening. OK. That's weird. Well, let's, um, let's take a look at why that might be happening. Let's go back to the server. Can anyone maybe think about why we're not able to pass data back up the chain? It's supposed to be bi-directional. Um, so remember that we're talking about asynchronous programming here. So from a server-side perspective, we're relying heavily on Neo and to be asynchronous and non-blocking. So we did this for a quick and dirty WebSocket server side, and we made a loop here, this repeat. Now, in essence, what we've done is we've created a non-blocking server platform, and we've just introduced blocking by making this loop. So what's happening here is that the client says, hey, let's have this conversation. The server says, no problem, let's start feeding you data. But the loop ties up the thread and never lets it go. So we've just created this loop that never actually opens itself up for communication again. So that ends up blocking. And now when I switch to Amazon, the server can never receive that, even though it's a WebSocket. So you may say, like, OK, well, let's put this on a asynchronous thread here and try again. 
Okay, so I'm going to start the server. Oops. I'm going to start the client again. Okay, so now it's working. Now let's go to Amazon. Okay, so now we can reach Amazon, and now we're getting it back. We have a two-way communication. That's awesome. Let's go back and forth a couple times here. Now, what you'll notice is happening. It's sort of working, but now we don't have that even one-second interval anymore. And on top of that, let's take a look at our memory usage. Ooh, that already doesn't look good. Let me just play around with this and, oh, we've got that hockey stick growth that every startup is looking for. Uh, that's not good, right? So, and I'm going to wrap up here because I'm running out of time, but I will explain what's going on here. So, adding this to a, a global async would, normally on the client side, that would be what we'd want to do. we just want to do an async, right? handle a different background thread or something like that. But what's happening on the server here is all we've done is said, okay, you want a new request? Cool, I'm gonna go start this asynchronous thread and then have a loop on that thread. And every time I use the segmented control, I send another uh, request to the same socket where you're using the socket. But on the server, that's just starting yet another thread with another loop and another thread and another loop and another thread and another loop. So from a server perspective, this is no good because each one is going to eat up its own resources and uh, it may have passed QA, but it's not going to last very long in production. Um, and I don't have time to get into the solution of this, but I will show you the solution. The solution itself actually turns out to be an entire talk on its own. Um, but to give you an idea, and this is related to NEO, okay, and asynchronous programming. So. And I'm not going to really, unfortunately, have time to explain this at all. But the solution here is to use, NEO has uh, the concept of workers and event loops. And if you really get deep into NEO, you can understand how to efficiently uh, create threads in NEO. Uh, you've got this worker equals multi-threaded event loop group. So I can actually create custom event loops and I can shut them down gracefully, I can control the number of threads, I can throttle them, all this really cool stuff. I, and I can schedule a repeated task. So instead of using a loop, which is not efficient and could eat up as much resources as the server wants to, or the script wants to, I can have this repeated task, which uh, actually is memory constrained by default and is efficient and all these things. So, um, and I've also changed the get stock quote function to use futures. So, again, I'm not going to get into it, but instead of just returning a stock, I'm going to return an event loop future, which returns a stock. Now, I'm only saying this to give you an idea of how this NEO stuff uh, plays into it. We don't have time to get into it, but that's the big difference, is using futures and all this stuff, you can really make efficient asynchronous code. And I'm returning a promise future result instead of an actual loop. All this stuff, let's try it again now. Let's build the server. Let's build the client again. Let's go back to our memory. Okay, so now we're getting Apple. Let's switch to Amazon. Okay, now let's switch back. Let's go back and forth, and you'll notice now we have that even one second interval because now we're managing threads effectively. They're not getting out of control. We're actually switching and shutting down each thread. So we actually only have one thread. We have an Apple thread and an Amazon thread happening and we're moving between them and that's why the intervals are correct now. Now you don't have all these threads speaking back. And even if I hammer on this thing, look at the memory. Maybe goes up a little bit, but as I stop, it will even out because I'm shutting those threads down gracefully. So that's the power of NEO when you get a little deeper, okay? So I'm going to wrap this up here. Uh, there's some awesome resources listed here, uh, mostly things I talked about, but if you want to get in 
Um, WWC has a lot of this stuff now for this year. Um, and as in the wise words of Confucius, you're now wise, so go make web sockets. <laughs> and uh, that's it. If you have any questions, we might have a few minutes or the overflow time. Uh, you can always find me at uh, Twitter at Cobeloper, uh, or I'll be around for the rest of the conference. Feel free to ping me. That's it. Any questions? Sure. So, as I mentioned, part of the protocol is that either the client or the server can disconnect at any time. Okay. The resiliency is actually in that. So even though it's a socket, um, anything can break away cleanly. They both know how to shut themselves down that way. Usually what you do on the client side is in the disconnect callback, which you'll get when that happens. Regardless of who disconnected, you'll get that callback. Um, if you want to maintain uptime, you just reconnect in the disconnect. But if you're going to a subway or something and you're losing connection, you're going to want to be a little smarter about that to not burn your battery or your radio down. So uh, in network framework, I mean, instead of using reachability, you can use NW path monitor, um, which will give you uh, a really efficient callbacks about your state. So maybe you'd only reconnect if you're able to, that kind of thing. But it's actually meant to be pretty good. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I know that the web sockets are you know, notoriously like, brutal on battery. Did, is there anything about uh, Apple's you know, baked-in implementation of web sockets that mitigates that? So the, the, the short answer is we don't know because it's a black box. Uh, talking to the developers, uh, the engineers at DubDub, uh, they hinted that uh, there's some Swift Neo and stuff under the hood there, but we just have to we just have to assume that Apple is doing the best they can, you know, to make the that stuff efficient. Um, I would say that for efficiency, it's actually pretty efficient, um, and it's more about what you do with the connection and how you handle disconnects, things like that. Any other questions? We're officially out of time, but I think we can a couple more questions if there's any overflow. Since uh, it's using URL session, can you use uh, separate things, maybe the delegate? So there is a, uh, so there's some delegates, I guess, was there a delegate in there? I guess the delegates are things like the disconnect and that stuff. It has its, I'd have to go back before I answer wrong. Um, it is URL session, so yeah, I think you do get some of the same baked in. I'd have to look it to be sure. I think the point is that the, the the category of API for the URL session WebSocket task is extremely small. There's not like a million functions you need to learn, which is kind of cool. Because in the actual framing protocol, it's pretty complicated for WebSockets. So they've abstracted a lot of that. And by the way, in the JavaScript API, you have to do a lot more. So this is much more simple than like doing hangouts in JavaScript. Anyone else? Cool, thank you. I'll be around if you have any other questions. Thanks a lot.